Good evening, everyone. Welcome, and thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Danny Wasserman, and I'm the director of the Lumen Christi Institute. Lumen Christi's mission is to share the Catholic intellectual tradition with the secular university and the broader culture. Another way I like to think of it is that we are here because Christianity is a thinking tradition. Christianity is a tradition that revels in questions. Tonight's, speak, tonight's uh, lecture by Warren Smith challenges us to rethink greatness in Christian terms. I'd like to tell you about a couple of upcoming events that we have. First, on Saturday, February 4th, we will host a Red Mass. Uh, for folks who don't know, uh, that I just found this out recently. A Red Mass is a Mass for members of the legal profession, uh, lawyers, law students, and judges, but anyone is welcome to join. There is going to be a Mass here in Bond Chapel, and followed by that, here in Swift Hall, there will be a lecture by Hannah Holborn Gray, former president of the university who will speak about why there are no lawyers in Thomas More's Utopia. Uh, it should be a wonderful uh, lecture. And a few days later, Thursday, February 9th, we will have a lecture on the history of the church entitled Catholicism from the French Revolution to Pope Francis. It's Thursday, February 9th, 5 p.m. in Social Sciences 201, the Tea Room. And that will be given by Professor John McGreevy, who is the provost at the University of Notre Dame. We will have Q&A after this evening's lecture. And at this time, I'd like to thank our co-sponsor, the Undergraduate Program in Religious Studies here at the University of Chicago. And uh, with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Aaron Walsh, who is the director of the Program in Religious Studies and a friend of Lumen Christi. Aaron. Uh, I am honored to introduce my teacher and mentor, Professor uh, J. Warren Smith. He is Professor of Historical Theology and the Director of the THD program at Duke Divinity School. He is also a United Methodist Minister in the North Carolina Annual Conference. Professor Smith has published numerous articles in journals such as the Harvard Theological Review, the Journal of Early Christian Studies, the Journal of Theological Studies, and the Journal of Religious Ethics. In addition, he has published monographs that have shaped the field, including Passion and Paradise, Human and Divine Emotion and the Thought of Gregory of Nyssa, Christian Grace and Pagan Virtue, the Theological Foundation of Ambrose's Ethics, and Ambrose, Augustine, and Pursuit of Greatness most recently. He is currently working on a volume about the development of theology from the apostolic era through the Byzantine period, culminating with the thought of Maximus the Confessor, entitled Early Christian Theology, A History. He is, has another project in the works, tentatively titled Plato and Christ, Platonism in Early Christian Theology. As a student at Duke, I had the privilege of learning from his eloquent lectures and expertly guided seminar discussions. The project of historical theology came alive in those settings, and I'm delighted that tonight and tomorrow, Professor Smith can share his expertise with us. Please join me in welcoming Professor Smith. It is a pleasure for me to be here at the University of Chicago. This is my first time to be here. And so I am grateful to Lumen Christi and to, to Danny and to Michael for organizing this and to uh, Aaron and the undergraduate program in religious studies for sponsoring it. It is indeed a pleasure to be with you. And I should say, one of the great gifts, as all of those of you who are teachers know, is that we are blessed by our students. And Erin certainly was no exception in that for me. So it's a pleasure to see where she has come. And uh, it's exciting to see where her students will go. And so the line continues. It is a leitmotif of the Gospel of Mark that the disciples were utterly clueless about who Jesus was. They didn't understand his identity as Messiah, and they certainly didn't understand the kingdom that he was proclaiming. And one of the most infamous episodes in that was in, chap in uh, chapter 9 of the Gospel. And there Jesus and the disciples have just arrived at Capernaum. And Jesus says to the disciples, uh, what were you talking about as we made our way? The disciples demure, because what they were talking about was the question, which one of them was the greatest? 
And Jesus, of course, gives his famous reply. The one who would be first of all must be servant of all. Now for us, as people who live in a culture where, at least theoretically, humility is deemed a virtue, we look upon the disciples' argument about who's the greatest as an act of total hubris and, and revealing all of their pretensions. Yet what we fail to recognize is that the language of greatness and the question, who is the greatest, was part and parcel of the moral discourse of antiquity. And no place does one see that more clearly than in Aristotle. Specifically, Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, Book 4. There, Aristotle is addressing the question, what is the virtuous attitude toward honor? Now, honor in antiquity isn't what we mean by honor. You and I think of honor as referring to our personal sense of integrity. But in antiquity, honor wasn't a private thing, but it was the public acclaim given for those who have exhibited excellence which benefits the community. Right? And therefore, honor came in the form of office or, in a military context, booty, trophies, prizes that were given. Now, the problem with honor was that Athens was an honor-shame culture, so shaped by the Homeric understanding of honor. Because, of course, all of Aristotle's students were young men who had been raised with the idea uh, shaped by Homer and the Homeric heroes such as Odysseus, Achilles, Ajax, all of whom valued honor more than life itself. Right. So the problem, though, was Aristotle's students, these young men from prominent families, came to love the honor more than they did the virtue which merited the honor. And so Aristotle is trying to complicate that picture. So he puts forward the definition of that virtue, which is the right attitude toward honor. It is megalopsukia, or greatness of soul, magnanimity. And for Aristotle, the great-souled man, and for Aristotle, it was a man, the great-souled man had two characteristics. He claimed high virtue for himself, but he also possessed the virtue that made him worthy of claiming that merit or that honor. In this sense, he stands as the golden mean between two extremes. On the one hand, the one Aristotle calls the presumptuous man, one who claims high honor but does not have the virtue to merit the honor. And the other extreme is the small-souled individual, one who merits honor, say, a position of public authority, but refuses to accept the authority. Right? What's significant is that for Aristotle, ultimately, it is the love of honor which, for the magnanimous man, is more, or the love of virtue is more important than the love of honor itself. Hear what Aristotle says. It is hard to be truly great-souled, for greatness of soul is impossible without moral nobility. Honor and dishonor, then, are objects with which the great-souled man is especially concerned. Great honors according to, uh, accorded by persons of worth will afford him pleasure in a moderate degree. He will feel he is receiving only what belongs to him, or even less, for no honor can be adequate of the merits of perfect virtue. Honor rendered by common people, or on trivial grounds, he will utterly despise, for this is not what he merits. He, therefore, to whom even honor is a small thing, will be indifferent to other things as well. Hence, the great-souled man is thought haughty. Now notice two thing, three things here. First, the great-souled man loves honor with a moderate fashion. For honor, he simply accepts it as what is his due, but he is moderate because he realizes no honor, however great, truly corresponds with the greatness of his virtue. 
Second, he is thought of as haughty for several reasons. One, he despises honors given by common people. Only those who are his peers, who possess the same virtue and truly appreciate how great he is, can give honors that are suitable. Moreover, he despises dishonor as a failure to recognize his excellence. And moreover, he is haughty because he despises the things the common people admire most, wealth, fame, and honor. And third, the great-souled individual has a strong sense of self-knowledge. He is self-conscious of his greatness. For the magnanimous man is almost vigilantly uh, scrupulous, excessively introspective, always seeking, checking himself to see to it that his life, his actions, his thoughts live up to the high ideal of virtue to which he aspires. Now, it is something of a truism to say that modern Western culture is a synthesis of the classical and the Christian, but it is not an easy synthesis. In fact, it is a, a cultural synthesis that entails a considerable degree of conflict. Right? And nowhere is that conflict seen than in not only their different understandings of virtue, but what they deem to be the highest level of virtue, greatness. Therefore, in the paper I'm about to present, what I want to do is to compare two literary uh, works, masterpieces, Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice and Fyodor Dostoevsky's The Brothers Karamazov. And in those texts, we will see figures who represent different forms of virtue and different conceptions of greatness. So let's begin with Jane Austen. In Pride and Prejudice, Mr. Darcy is Jane Austen's great-souled man. She is consciously modeling Darcy on Aristotle's description. He is, after all, a man whose manner is so grand that he commands the eyes of all when he walks into a ballroom. While his companion, Mr. Bingley, is good-looking and gentlemanlike, with a pleasant countenance and easy, unaffected manners, Mr. Darcy is fine, a tall person, handsome features, noble mien, having 10,000 a year. Even in Mr. Wickham's libelous testimony, Mr. Darcy is credited with being liberal and generous, willing to give his money freely, to display hospitality, to assist his tenants and relieve the poor. But from the very first appearance at the local ball, Darcy is quickly discovered to be proud, to be above his company, having a most forbidding, disagreeable countenance. Although his superior bearing alienates him from the lesser gentry of Hertfordshire, most especially his future wife, Elizabeth Bennet. Austen offers a corrective to Elizabeth's severe judgment in the voice of Elizabeth's dearest and most trusted friend, Miss Charlotte Lucas. She says of Darcy, his pride does not offend me so much as pride often does because there is an excuse for it. One cannot wonder why so very fine a young man with family, fortune, everything in his favor, should think highly of himself. If I may express it so, he has a right to be proud. Mr. Darcy's pride and disdain for the pretensions of the mediocre, a disposition totally compatible with Aristotle's great-souled man, is for Austin a simple expression of the truth. He has a right to be proud. Indeed, Mr. Darcy owns his pride unapologetically. The other major male figures, Mr. Wickham, Mr. Collins, and Mr. Bingley, are guilty of some semblance of excellence in their character, and thus they serve as a foil for Mr. Darcy's honesty and forthrightness about his genuine superiority in virtue. First, Mr. Wickham. Mr. Wickham's civility and perfect manners create a 
facade that conceals his vicious character and seduces Elizabeth into believing the slanderous things he says against Mr. Darcy. Mr. Collins, on the other hand, is not a vicious man in any malicious sense. Rather, he is by nature a mediocre individual without good sense, who, simply because of his university education and the patronage of Lady Catherine de Bourgh, has come to an unwarranted high opinion of himself. The result is that Mr. Collins is, quote, a mixture of pride and obsequiousness, self-importance and humility, end quote. If Mr. Darcy is rightfully proud, as a great-souled man is, Mr. Collins corresponds to Aristotle's vain or pretentious man who claims for himself more honors than he is worth or deserves. Since his pretensions fool no one, Mr. Collins turns out to be the biggest fool of all, since he is self-deceived. Now, Mr. Bingley. Even Mr. Bingley's self-deprecatory remarks about his carelessness as a writer are a form of false humility. As Darcy points out to his friend, quote, you are really proud of your defects in writing because you consider them as proceeding from rapidity of thought and careless execution. The power of doing anything with quickness is always a prize to the possessor. Then Mr. Darcy exposes his friend's dishonesty. Quote, nothing is more deceitful than the appearance of humility. It is often only carelessness of opinion and sometimes an indirect boast. Although Mr. Bingley, unlike Mr. Collins or Mr. Wickham, is a genuinely good man, a suitor worthy of Elizabeth's truly good sister, Jane, Austen uses Mr. Bingley's relationship with Darcy to illustrate the difference between the merely good and the truly great. There is, however, a liability that comes with Mr. Darcy's awareness of his excellent character, a liability he knows, though it is not clear he views it as a liability. Namely, his uncompromising rectitude renders him totally impatient of fools and unforgiving of the vicious. The principal fools in the story are Elizabeth's mother, Mrs. Bennet, and her silly younger sisters. Mr. Darcy's unfavorable judgment of them, Elizabeth must admit, is accurate. But Darcy's correct sense of his superiority does not allow him to be gracious to those who are unworthy. Consequently, he refuses to extend to them the social courtesies one would expect at a ball by dancing with or engaging in conversation with any of the Bennet daughters. As Mr. Darcy's foil, Mr. Bingley's easiness, openness, and ductility of temper, qualities that genuinely endear him to Mr. Darcy, allow him to appreciate the local gentry, their pleasant, unaffected manners, and the kindness and attention they have paid him. By contrast, Mr. Darcy deemed these provincials lacking in beauty, fashion, and anything that could possibly pique his interest. His self-conscious sense of superiority is not disguised, but outwardly manifest in a haughty comportment, reflecting his silent contempt that instantly estranges him from the local society. However correct his assessment of Hertfordshire gentry and the Bennet daughters is, it initially blinds him to the merits of that one woman, Elizabeth, who will eventually ask to be his wife. And even after Darcy falls in love with Elizabeth, his sense of superiority is the source of deep humiliation when his offer of marriage, much to his bewilderment, is rejected by a social inferior. More severe than his judgment of merely foolish or mediocre people 
is his unrelenting disdain for individuals with deep failures of character. As he acknowledges to Elizabeth, my temper is, I believe, too little yielding, certainly too little for the conveniences of the world. I cannot forget the follies and vices of others so soon as I ought, nor their offenses against me. My good opinion, once lost, is lost for a good. Mr. Darcy's haughty comportment and slowness to forgive is grounded in his consciousness of his own virtue. Mr. Wickham's assessment of him is not far off the mark. Quote, Almost all of Darcy's actions may be traced to pride, and pride has often been his best friend. It has connected him nearer with virtue than any other feeling. End quote. Yet, through Elizabeth's reproof, and his budding affection for her, Darcy comes to recognize the egotistic character of his pride. As he confesses to her, almost confirming Mr. Wickham's assessment of his pride, quote, I have been a selfish being all my life, in practice though not in principle. As a child, I was taught what was right, but I was not taught to correct my temper. I was given good principles to follow, but left to follow them with pride and conceit. My parents almost taught me to be selfish and overbearing, to care for none beyond my family circle, to think meanly of all the rest of the world, to wish at least to think meanly of their sense and their worth compared to my own. In this sense, Darcy's chief motive for virtue is, as Aristotle calls it, philautia, self-love, that desires what is best for oneself, namely virtue, because nothing is as ennobling for the soul as virtue. It is doubtful that Mr. Darcy loves his honor in the Homeric sense more than he does virtue itself. His his confidence in and contentment with his own rectitude is closer to Aristotle's ideal than to Homer's. Nevertheless, it is certain that he loves his virtue because it sets him apart from all that is common and all people who are common. He never forgets his superiority, which is the standard by which he judges all others. It is a nearly tragic flaw because it nearly causes him to fail in gaining the approbation and love of the one woman in whose friendship he finds happiness. Now let's move from Regency England to Tsarist Russia. If Mr. Darcy's is is a paragon of virtue cut from the Aristotelian mold, Fyodor Dostoevsky's Father Zosima, in the Brothers Karamazov, is a virtuous man cut from a very different mold, as is evident in his reaction to fools, both the proud and the insolent. This is in evidence during a visit by Fyodor Karamazov and his sons, Ivan and uh, Dmitri, to see his youngest son, Alyosha, at Father Zosima's monastery. Here, Fedor Karamazov is every bit as infuriating in his buffoonery during his visit to the monastery as is Mrs. Bennet in the pursuit of husbands for her silly daughters. Fedor's sons, Ivan and Alyosha, are mortified by their father's conduct and his fantastically absurd stories of the atheist Diderot's conversion to Christianity and an Orthodox saint who carries around with him his own decapitated head. If the rest of the company is embarrassed, the self-styled sophisticate Pyotr Musov is nearly apoplectic. Yet Karamazov does not seem to elicit any hint of disdain from the aged monk Zosima. Even when Karamazov declares, I am not afraid of your opinion, You are, every one of you, worse than I am. Only then to parody 
the question of the rich young ruler to Jesus, Teacher, what must I do to gain eternal life? Father Zosima, like Jesus, who looked on the young man lovingly, Mark 10, 21, Zosima looked on him with a smile and answered in words that treated the buffoon with courteous respect. Musov, however, a man with a high opinion of himself and his cleverness, is quite another matter. Dostoevsky uses Musov as a foil for Zosima, thereby highlighting the latter's holy patience. Clearly, Musov views the monks with contempt. As he says, the devil take them all, an outer show elaborated through the centuries, and nothing but charlatanism and nonsense underneath. End quote. Nevertheless, Musov observes all the social courtesies do one's host. This, however, is but a ploy, a way of demonstrating his superiority and preserving his dignity. It is precisely in this self-regard, though, that he is vulnerable to irritation at Karamazov's ridiculous antics. He feels his dignity is compromised by being in company with such a fool. And it is precisely this fear of being thought base himself by mere association with such an embarrassing individual that provides Karamazov with a weapon to undercut Musov. Strategically, Karamazov uses his foolishness to throw everyone, especially Musov, off balance, as Musov concedes. Now I know myself. I am annoyed. I shall lose my temper and begin to quarrel and lower myself and my ideas." End quote. Whereas Musov, ever self-conscious of dignity, loses his self-control and is drawn into Karamazov's web and made to look ridiculous himself, Father Zosima does not fall prey to Karamazov's charades, but maintains his self-control. Indeed, his concern is not for his own dignity, but for the comfort of both Musov, to whom he says, I beg you, do not disturb yourself. I particularly beg you, be my guest. And to Karamazov, saying, make yourself quite at home, and above all, do not be ashamed of yourself, for that is at the root of it all." End quote. Sagaciously, Zosima sees behind the fears and pretensions of visitors of all social and spiritual ranks. He names their hurts and desires, not to set himself above them, but out of compassion. The seriousness with which he engages each guest is clear in his exchange with Yvonne on the philosophical question of whether the love of humankind is possible if there is no immortality. Unlike Musov and Dmitri, who think of this as a foolish, sophomoric question, Father Zosima recognizes that Yvonne is not playing the intellectual but that his question arises out of an existential quandary that is a real torment. Quote, You were not altogether joking. That is true. The question is still on your heart, and it is your great grief, for it clamors for an answer. Thank the Creator who has given you such a lofty heart capable of such suffering. End quote. It is Zosima's sympathetic regard for Ivan's concern that causes Ivan, the sincerely skeptical intellectual, to show the elder reverence by coming forward to receive a blessing and to kiss his hand. Dostoevsky's Father Zosima and Austin's Mr. Darcy are a study in contrasts. Unlike Musov, Mr. Darcy is a man of true dignity and virtue. Yet Darcy's sense of self is grounded primarily in his superior virtue, so that it makes him intolerant of those who are base, vicious, and generally vulgar. 
inequality in virtue creates a wall of separation. He does not suffer fools, period. One can well imagine what would happen in Darcy's mind if Fedor Karamazov ever came to Pemberley. Though Father Zosima possesses very much, every bit as much, self-mastery as Darcy, his chief virtue is compassion that tears down the walls of dishonesty, the public mask and private self-delusions that alienate people from one another, from God, and from themselves. Zosima is not blind to the disparity in character, but neither is his sense of self grounded in virtue. Rather, his soul is caught up in a rapturous love for God's word in Scripture and its power to be a sanctifying seed in the hearts of the Russian peasants. Believing in God's people and that the word can do in them gives him a humble vision of God's holiness. This is the source of his compassion, a compassion that allows him not merely to endure with gritted teeth vulgarians and fools, but to welcome them and speak to the wounded soul that lies behind the mask. Unlike Mr. Darcy, Zosima suffers fools because he knows he was once such a fool. Like Musov, having, quote, a surface polish of courtesy and society manners, acquired together with the French language, end quote. His, um, his too, was a love of honor without recognizing the vanity of honor. Knowing the unity of creation in God, he came to see that, quote, in truth, we are each responsible to all for all. Therefore, Christians cannot let even a love of virtue separate him from others. An egoist ethic that is centered upon one's virtue, even when that virtue benefits the community, is but a form of divisive individualism. Everyone strives, Father Zosima explains, to keep his individuality as apart as possible, wishes to secure the greatest possible fulfillment of life for himself, but meanwhile, all his efforts result not in attaining fullness of life, but self-destruction. For instead of self-realization, he ends by achieving a complete solitude. For he is accustomed to rely upon himself alone and to cut himself off from the whole." End quote. Even when the virtue one loves is the love of one's neighbors, if one loves the virtue more than one loves the neighbor, then the virtue divides rather than unites. Dostoevsky illustrates this in the relationship between Katerina Ivanovna and Dmitri Karamazov. Because Dmitri, the wastrel among the brothers, saves Katerina from an embarrassing experience, Katerina decides to marry Dmitri in order to reform him. But Dmitri sees through Katerina's messianic desire to save him from himself, when, resenting her magnanimous condescension, he declares bitterly, she loves her own virtue, not me. Fortunately, by contrast, Darcy's love for Elizabeth came to surpass his pride, and ultimately he is joined to her and finds in her a kindred virtue and therefore true happiness. Now, this comparison between Mr. Darcy and Father Zosima illustrates a tension within the synthesis of classical and Christian conceptions of virtue. What is missing in Mr. Darcy that is central to Father Zosima's character is a profound sense of grace. That is, a confidence in the unmerited and transformative mercy of God who makes his abode in the hearts 
of the humble. In the indwelling of God, not his own virtue, that is precisely the source of greatness. And this is precisely the view one hears articulated in Augustine's description of being a great soul. Commenting on the words from Isaiah 57, quote, He gives to the small soul greatness of soul, and he gives life to those who are humble in heart. Augustine glosses this verse this way, quote, The holy ones are those in whom God has his rest, and to these small-souled people he gives greatness of soul. And having given greatness of soul, he makes lofty those in whom, having rested, he dwells on high. I mean, the idea is, for Augustine, that when God dwells in the heart of the humble, God is present with them, and wherever God is, they are there. So God has raised them up to heaven to be with him. As with Aristotle's great-souled man, Augustine's small-souled Christian possesses self-knowledge, the knowledge that she is absolutely dependent on God's grace. She also knows that the end for which human beings were made is not thought of as the actualization of the highest potentialities in human nature, what Aristotle calls eudaimonia, or happiness. Rather, she thinks of her end in relational terms, resting in the blessedness of fellowship with God, a rest characterized by freedom from what Augustine calls curvatus, that self-preoccupation characteristic of sin. This freedom is the rest of self-forgetfulness. As Augustine declares, the life as it declares in his description of the life of the resurrection in Confessions, Book 9. If the very soul itself is making no sound and is surpassing itself by no longer thinking about itself, then God alone would speak. This is the self-forgetfulness of which Charles Wesley sings in the final verse of his hymn, Love divine, all loves excelling. Change from glory into glory, till with thee we take our place, till we cast our crowns before thee, lost in wonder, love, and praise. The beatific rest that is the end of the Christian life is not without virtue. There is an excellent of life that is necessary for fellowship with God, namely holiness. It is, as Hebrews 12, 14 says, that without which no one will see the Lord. But the virtue of holiness is not a private excellence, but is lived out within the community of believers and the larger world of non-believers. It is, as John Wesley put it, a social holiness, the goal of which is the fulfillment of Jesus' high priestly prayer in John 17, that his disciples may be one, even as he and the Father are one. In the present life, such social holiness is a struggle to preserve the bonds of charity amid deep division of opinion and differing degrees of virtue. Yet. To be members of a church composed of sinners rather than great-souled people, the only way the church's mission of bearing witness to the holiness and unity of the triune God can be preserved is to pray for patient and forbearing love of God. With this in mind, Augustine exhorted the North African Christians during the Donatist controversy, quote, He who loves his brother tolerates everything for the sake of unity, because brotherly love exists in unity with charity. Listen to the psalm. Quote, there is a great peace for those who love your law and no scandal for them. End quote. And why won't there be scandal? 
because they will put up with each other. As Paul says, put up with one another in love, striving to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now, the toleration that Augustine has in mind is not permissive. Rather, it is an image of the Father's forbearing love that reproves and disciplines, continually renewing the covenant even where sin and disobedience recur. As all virtue, the preservation of unity through an Augustinian toleration is hard and even wearing on the soul. Yet such a struggle has a hope of success if the Christian possesses the humility and self-knowledge of Augustine's small-souled man, like Father Zosima, who exchanges the pharisaical pride of self-regard for the meekness of the publican's prayer, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Um, that was um, thought-provoking. I guess you you touched on some of the issues that it means. Well, before you got to uh, Dostoevsky and Saint Augustine, you know, I I was concerned about how where we would go from Darcy as as an exemplar of. of I mean, I'm I'm fine with English literature, but I, I'm I'm not so enthralled with 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 you know English men and royal uh, society generally. Um, but <laughs> How, how, how can this be applied in, say, an American context where, where perhaps there's no real stable social relationships, where, where we struggle to identify a place and then map out uh, uh, kind of a, a context for virtuous behavior because it's all very dependent upon results, um, the, the expedient. Um, so there's no, there seems to be no lasting or, or anchored virtues or, or s modes of behavior that, that would inform conduct from generation to generation, perhaps even from business cycle to business cycle. But. I, would, I would think that one of the ways that, one of the relevance of it is that, I mean, it illustrates just your point, that virtue has to be shaped in the context of a tradition. And I think part of that is a tradition in which you have shared texts so that you have common points of reference. Um, and also then in which you have people who are consciously seeking to, you know, if you will, to put it simply, to be good and have an idea of what goodness is that would order their life both individually and their life within a particular community. Um, and I, I suspect the problem, I mean the challenge, one challenge might be, the more diverse our societies become, the challenge is if, if I don't know your canon and you don't know mine, how can you have a common sense of what virtuous behavior is? What is excellence, right? Um, now the one thing that I will say is, that if Athens was an honor-shame culture, the modern academy is an honor-shame culture as well, right? Um, and, um, and along with that can come a sense, of, um, a sense of one's own superiority over others whose scholarship doesn't quite measure up to one's own standard, right? And so instead of, I mean, the remarkable thing is when you have a scholar and I'm thinking about one particular person on your faculty who's one of the most brilliant people I know, but who is also one of the most gracious people, especially dealing with junior scholars and students. You know? And so I think in that sense, that combination of the desire for excellence as opposed to mediocrity, but nevertheless an accompanying humility that recognizes just the inequality of people's gifts. That I think for the academy, um, this sort of comparison is an apt thing to, uh, uh, to be reflective about. <laughs>
Um, we have a question from our online audience. Uh, Chiara O'Rourke asks, um, do you think that Aristotle's magnanimous man is just a vicious man, a proud one by Christian standards? Or do you think he's onto something and is describing something that is on track to virtue, but incomplete? Good. I would think the latter. I mean, here's what to me is so, I mean, you know, if you have someone to pick from the men in, um, uh, in um, uh, Pride and Prejudice, you know, absolutely Darcy is a better sort of person, you know, than the, the sycophantish Mr. Collins, sadly in my profession, um, or Mr. Wickham. And ultimately, it is Darcy's commitment to his virtue that leads him, you know, ultimately um, to save Elizabeth's sister and Mr. Wickham. So I think, I think there is a sense in which it's incomplete. And I think part of the, I mean, any good literature, you see character development. And I do think part of the, um, for Aristotle, part of the thing about a friend is that the friend has virtues that both challenge you to be virtuous and also let you see yourself rightly. And as his relationship with Elizabeth grows, he is able to see his pride and the way in which his preoccupation with his virtue is that stumbling stone to unity. Um, so I think, I mean, there are many qualities about the magnanimous man that I think are, are, are on target. I mean, one of the things I didn't talk about was that with Aristotle's magnanimous man, I think there's a real shift from an entirely externalized sense of honor to an internalized sense of honor, such that one, unlike Achilles, who doesn't receive his honor, has Briseis taken from him, and therefore has a colossal temper tantrum in his tent and refuses to fight, right? I mean, Darcy would sort of, you would expect, would fight anyway if the cause was noble, um, or Aristotle's magnanimous man would fight with a full sense of his own excellence, even though he would you know, think Agamemnon was foolish and base for not recognizing his excellence appropriately. Yeah. First of all, thank you for the talk. Um, it was really fascinating. Maybe I missed this at the very beginning, so hopefully you did not already say something about this, but I'm curious in your research how much you delved into the differences between the compatibility of Catholic thought and Protestant thought with classical thinking. Because to me, based on your talk, perhaps the Aristotelian idea of the magnanimous man is more compatible with Protestant thought and the gospel of wealth, but perhaps not so compatible with traditional Catholic thought from which it could be criticized as being prideful. Good question. I think if, well, I should say, and I, I don't know enough to go into great detail on this, Thomas, of course, does pick up the magnanimous man and talk about magnanimity in terms of hope, all right? Um, and so I, I won't go any farther than that. I think there is probably a, I mean, you can have self-righteous people in every denomination or every tradition. Um, I think there is, I think one of the dangers sometimes in Protestantism is that there can be, if there is an emphasis on grace as unmerited forgiveness, that doesn't also carry a notion of grace as sanctifying, filling us with the love of God so that we may genuinely mirror God's holiness, right, so that we are, you know, fit for heaven, right, um, there can be a certain Protestant complacency, right, um, but also there can be, I think, and part of the critique that I'm making is sometimes, and I think I saw this most in college Christianity, that there's this, this scrupulousness in which you know, especially young Christians are trying to take their spiritual blood pressure every day to see whether they are making spiritual progress. You know, and that, that, that's just a recipe for disaster, for frustration, and ultimately for sort of maybe leaving the faith. Um, as opposed to the sense that grace works on the long haul, and we in fact 
And this is where I think Aristotle's idea of eudaimonia, which he says we don't know, in a sense, until we're on our deathbed and look back and see, have we really actualized the potentials that are proper to human nature? Have I been a good human being? And I think there's that a, a strong sense, and I think you, this would fit nicely with Catholic thought, the sense of dying in a state of grace. You know, do you look back and see the ways in which grace has been active in your life so that there has been transformation, but you know it's not, it's not my work, but it is grace working through me? I wonder what uh, you might draw from this for contemporary politics in America, that the right wing says that people in disadvantaged circumstances need virtue. Uh, the left says that virtue is just this uh, playing for a zero-sum prideful contest, and the standards of virtue are really arbitrary and uh, don't matter. But in a way, looking at both of these stories, uh, Darcy, there is a serious content of virtue, and one knows what it is. But one can say that when there are people in disadvantaged circumstances, that one owes a kind of missionary duty to help them be realize as much potential as they can. And so that indicates a kind of uh, way past the left versus right argument. Yeah, I, I would love to see you know, more scenes in Pemberley in which you see um, Darcy's interaction with his tenants, the people on his estate, the people in his household, which Wickham says is, is exemplary, you know. And, I mean, so the, the, one of the gaps, I think, in the argument that I wish were firmer, other than you have the testimony of the one housekeeper who shows them around and, you know, praises Darcy, um, that that gives a sense that when Darcy is interacting with those of a lower social status, he doesn't do it in a manner of sort of noblesse oblige, but perhaps a genuine concern for those who are in his inner family. Um, so perhaps the virtue without sort of the sanctimonious confidence uh, might be a w one way to think about it. But I think you're absolutely right. Virtue is vital so long as we don't assume that everybody is equally capable or that circumstances allow you know, uh, uh, everybody to uh, achieve the same degree of virtue, perhaps, but at the same time emphasizing that there is agency that we have. And one of the, the claims of the Catholic tradition is that grace precisely gives us that agency. Yeah, good question. Um, yeah, I just had a question about, I, I appreciate the way in which you, you break down the importance of having this, this or the, perhaps the benefit that Christianity can give by providing an end or an ideal of God that can couple to virtue and can really you know, shift the focus from oneself to something else. But I wonder, particularly you talked about you know, troubles within Protestantism, what do we do when we lack a correct conception or a substantial conception of the divine or of that end? How do we then start to have that conversation um, in both virtuous ways, but also in ways that sort of guide us back to a, a correct vision of ourselves and of our communities? I think one of the central elements of a correct sense of who God is can be found I mean, a text that's grown on me over the last years and has gained a centrality in my own theology is the high priestly prayer in John 17. Because it's talking about community, but it's grounded on who God is. Father, Son, and Spirit are united, and therefore their unity becomes the basis for those who are united to Christ, such that the disciples being united to Christ, then become partakers of the very love that binds Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So I think you have to have that strong theology to be the foundation for your ecclesiology. Otherwise, your ecclesiology is weak. And I think one of the tragic things in, one of the tragic things for me watching my own Methodist church go through its, its fissure is the impatience, the refusal to be patient and tolerant with one another, such that, well, if so-and-so is not conforming with my idea of justice or righteousness, I'll just 
cut off and go off and do my own thing. And we've seen since the Reformation just how many times people have cut themselves off. And so I would, I mean, my prayer for my fellow Protestants is that we would take John 17 a little more seriously. First, thank you again. Uh, and this is a, a question from me, though I, I do have another from the audience. But um, I don't think we have an appreciation today as to why a small-souled man within Aristotle might be a vice. Could you sharpen that for us, especially in light, I, I mean, I, I thought I heard something that you said to the effect of um, they have virtue but fail to accept the public honors, the public roles, perhaps the public political positions or leadership roles. I don't, I don't know. Could you pr underline within a, uh, that more communal setting um, why that might be a sharp distinction and perhaps why it might be threatening such that a Christian tradition turns it on its head? Sure. I think what's critical one of the things to be said is that in the Nicomachean Ethics, what Aristotle says about the small-souled individual and what he then says in the Eudaimonist Ethics, it's slightly different. The Eudaimonist Ethics brings out the sense of the small-souled person is, say, the son of a, of, of a family that is significant who is expected to sort of stand up and take social responsibilities and therefore has sort of all the education and the, the virtue to do that, but instead of serving the common good, they just sort of withdraw. Dare I say sort of, you know, simply pursuing their own private interests rather than committing themselves to a life of service. And of course, that tension between life of service and the life of withdrawal is, is dominant in classical literature, and the Romans especially take that issue up. Um, so I think that's part of the, the issue. Where I think the, the small-souled person is a real problem is if you have somebody with genuine gifts, but they're afraid to use it, and that they, um, uh, both that they, you know, they don't recognize their own gifts, and they don't recognize the way in which God, within Catholic theology, gives the grace that takes those gifts beyond a purely natural capacity to a supernatural capacity. Okay? I mean, one example of someone being small-souled is Moses before the burning bush, sort of demurring, oh, no, no, I'm not a good speaker, I can't do this, thus and such. Okay? And yet, of course, he turns out to be one of the great prophets. Right? I mean, that would be an example of someone that, who is small-souled in the sense he is inclined to abdicate social responsibility rather than sort of, you know, taking the bit between your teeth and, and, and leading on. Yeah. I think she had a question. And thank you for the talk. Um, I was um, wondering, um, when you chose that sequence, uh, Jane Austen, uh, Dostoevsky, and then Augustine, um, uh, what was your motivation? Because um, clearly you have, you know, an chronologically, <laughs> you're not going in any particular order. Um, because uh, Zasima was a monk, and because it's an Orthodox Christian tradition, you did mention, already talking about Augustine, uh, a social holiness. So monks would not sign their artwork. I mean, uh, it's a complete um, sort of um, self um, uh, annihilation in some ways. So it's in some ways a kind of a kenosis. Um, and in Orthodox Christianity, obviously, horizontal um, uh, relationship to God is stronger than a vertical, you know, Western. Um, and in Augustine, you know, you know the famous uh, uh, amor meo, pondos meo. You know, the 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 lighter your soul is, the higher, the closer to God you are. So, if you can just maybe like kind of comment on that because I was wondering like why you chose it in that way because you're clearly leading to uh, divisiveness and lonely loneliness of um, pretend you know thank you I think the simple way that I made that move was growing out of my teaching all right I mean I taught a course um, I taught a course when I was at, um, at Wabash and then at Yale called uh, virtue and virility uh, Christian and non-Christian conceptions of masculinity. And I, you know, we didn't read 
Pride and Prejudice. But when we talked about Aristotle's Great Souled Man, it, in conversation it came out, well, Darcy's an example, right? And so I began to explore that further. But the logic of the sequence is that, in some ways, Darcy sort of might occupy a middle position between the, the, the sort of Christian ideal of, of, Zosima, of, of Father Zosima and Aristotle. I mean, I think Darcy makes more concessions toward the end than perhaps the great souled man might. You know, I don't know that, but I, that's, that's sort of a hunch. But then it's really seeing Zosima, who's never described as great, it's sort of like sort of the absence of great, why would you bring him in? But that Zosima representing this one who is not troubled by the dubious activity of sort of spiritual social inferiors, just sets that contrast. So Darcy really sets up what you, you, you see that's striking in Zosima. And so, and then, I, and then I saw, you know, just thinking about Augustine, uh, those texts just came together as I was thinking through Dostoevsky. I think that's, those are all the questions we have time for. Uh, before we thank our wonderful speaker, I invite you to join us over some wine and cheese to continue rethinking what it means to be great. And if you, if you would like to hear more, learn more from Professor Smith, I think there's still maybe time to sign up for an afternoon master class, a seminar that we have at Gavin House tomorrow at 2 p.m. You can find information about it online on lumenchristi.org. And the last thing I promise uh, is that we have a survey about this event. There are some QR codes back there on the table. So uh, please take the survey. Uh, that will help us to, to offer effective programs in the future. And finally, please join me in thanking our wonderful speaker. Thank you.